turn in your Bibles with me. Turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. And I'm going to read from verses 41. Only one verse. Genesis chapter 27 and verses 41. The Bible says this. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Let us pray. Father, speak today. We need a word from you. Lord, many of us have been in relationships. And some of it, O oh God, has gone sour. But we ask today, O oh God, that you will give us a word of encouragement that we'll continue to serve you and we'll forgive. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Restoring broken relationships. This young lady came into church. Her name is Heather. I'm telling you her name is Heather because I'm not telling you her real name. Heather came into church with her bestie, her good friend, whose name is Julie. And before long, they joined a Bible study, and there was a tall, dark, and handsome young man by the name of Tim. Tim had just come out of another relationship, didn't want to start anything new, but before long, they were studying the Word together. He caught an eye for Julie, and Julie caught an eye for him. You know how this thing goes. And they started dating. But Julie had her career going on. She had school going on. She had bills. And so she was so focused on all these things that she was not paying Tim the attention that he thought he needed. Before long, the relationship was escalating into something more, more, more serious. And they introduced themselves to each other's families. You know it's serious then. But, but, but. Things were not going right. Can someone say, help me? Things were not going right. And before long, Julie realized that the relationship was beginning to crumble. But her bestie, Heather, was always there. Heather decided that she was going to play mediator and started to come in and talk with them. Before long, Heather and Tim started to talk over the phone about the relationship. Help me, somebody. And as they continued to talk, they realized that they had a liking for each other. They had many similarities. And in Heather's mind, she was thinking for a moment, I can't do this because that's my bestie from yay high. But something in her heart said, well, she's not treating him right anyway. She's not doing right anyway. That if she was following the word of God, she would treat him better. I can do better. And therefore, she was conflicted. And before long, as she was thinking and praying about the decision, praying about the decision, praying hard about the decision, she realized that she was probably the best thing for him. And she decided, like many other individuals, she was going to shoot her shot. You all know that third term, right? She was going to shoot her shot. So she told Tim one evening, not in the presence of her bestie, that she was the best thing for him, that God led her to that decision. And since they were already talking, she decided, and he decided, that they, it was best that he ended things with the bestie, Julie, and they start something new. Now, some of you are saying, look, she ain't a bestie. She cold as ice. But you all know that relationships sometimes turn sour. And when you least expect it, things can develop. And so things developed. And poor Julie was left empty-handed with no one next to her. Still working, toiling. My friends, as we think about this, relationships are difficult. Relationships are difficult. Relationships fall apart for many different reasons. Some of you can even think right now that you have ended some relationships because of arguments. 
Some because of betrayal, like in this case. Some have ended relationships because of money. Some because of absolute selfishness, which took time to be revealed. Some of us have ended relationships because of envy, because of jealousy, because of cheating, because of misunderstandings, because of competition. Has anyone been, you know what I'm talking about? Because of lack of communication, because inattentiveness, because of distance. Someone said, look, if she's going away, I can't be in a relationship with her. I don't do the long distance thing. Let's face it. We see and we hear and experience the issues and challenges of relationships every day. Marriages fail. Friendships crumble. Families will feud. Siblings will disagree. Co-workers would fight. And there, should I say it? Church folk will argue. Relationships are hard work. When a relationship is broken, emotions run high. Anger develops, frustration mounts, resentment builds, bitterness grows, disappointment ensues, and confusion evolves. Some broken relationships saw love turn to hate, happiness turn to bitterness, adoration turn to disgust. The truth is maintaining positive relationships over the long term can be challenging. Am I the only one? Especially when there are people who make it tough even to like them, much less to love them. There are some who are great at pushing your every button, including the last one. Some get on every nerve, especially your last. Some take advantage of your patience. You get used for the money you got or you don't have. Some people will scam you and take your money. Some will stab you in the back after you have done everything for them. Some you even brought into this country and signed paperwork and now they won't even call you. Some you gave money for school, but now they won't even say hello to you. Some you helped to get that job, but now they walk right by you as if they don't know your name. Some will... Turn their backs on you. Some individuals you even allowed to sleep in your bed. And now they won't even talk to you. Because relationships are hard work. Some you stood at the altar and confessed before family and friends and God that you will love them forever. But they turned around and said they don't love you. Some will use you. Lie on you. Lie to you. And some will be like an ungrateful dog. They will be by your side one minute and turn around and bite you the next. Relationships are hard work. And people can be cruel. In fact, in fact, the sad reality is that so many people can be cruel. And when it's friends, it's one thing. But when it's family, it's another. All right. Family members will be the ones who will really put the nail in your coffin. Sometimes it's not your friends, it's the people you say are blood that will turn their backs on you. The ones who say they got your back and then all of a sudden you realize the knife is in it and is turning. Jacob and Esau were twin brothers. Their parents are Isaac and Rebekah. And while in Rebekah's womb, they were constantly wrestling with each other. And of course, this was just a foreshadowing of their broken future relationship. Esau was born first and thereby became the legal heir to the family birthright. He is the rightful heir to the covenant between God and Abraham. And remember, God said to Abraham, I'm going to make your family so great that they will be like the stars in the sky. My friends, most of the family wealth will be passed on to Esau. Decisions were to be made by Esau. Esau, we're told, was a skillful hunter, but his father's favorite. 
And here is a note to parents, be cautious of choosing favorites when you have children. Esau, the Bible says, was red. His skin was red. And his whole body was like a hairy garment. He grew up to be an outdoorsman. Jacob was more interested in staying at home, but developed into a clever and conniving man. Jacob, the Bible says, was a plain man, a simple man, but was his mother's favorite. The Hebrew word for plain is the same word in scripture that's translated as perfect and upright and undefiled, but the Bible says that his name actually meant deceiver. Esau came from the field one day, and he was tired and faint. And Esau was very dramatic. So he came to his brother Jacob and said, Brother, I've been in the field all day, and I'm tired. Don't you see me? I'm about to drop dead on the ground unless I get some food. But remember, Jacob was good in the house. So he made a wonderful meal. He made some stew, Roxanne, and it was real good. He put some spices in that stew, and it was so good that when, when, when Esau walked in, he said, mm, I need some of that stew, brother. And his brother saw this as an opportunity to get his own. Esau was there, and he said, my brother, I need some of that stew. And knowing the character of his brother, Jacob replied, Sell me this day your birthright. He was thinking about food, but his brother was thinking about the future. You know anybody that's like that? You are thinking like this, but they're way light years ahead. And here he is, Jacob, who is, who is conniving. He's a deceiver. He's deceiving his brother now and trying to get hold of what is rightfully his. I'm at the point of hunger, he said, and death. And Esau says in chapter 25 and verses 32 to 34, what profit shall this birthright do to me? What he didn't realize is that he's giving away something precious for something temporary. And many individuals, let me say this, many individuals will give away their future for something temporary. Men, can I talk with you? Many relationships has ended because somebody chose to give away something for their future for something temporary. Something temporary. A few minutes of pleasure for your future. And, and, and what the Bible points out to us is that here Esau doesn't even value the fact that God has called him for a specific purpose. God has enlisted him to carry on a lineage for the future generations, and he sells it for just a few pieces of soup. The Bible says that years later, when their father Isaac was close to death, it became time to give Esau his blessing as the firstborn. And Isaac asked Esau to go to hunt for a special meal, and then he would pass the special blessing to him. But it was Rebekah, their mother, that overheard the plan and devised her own plan. She had Jacob disguise himself as Esau and bring Isaac the meal instead while his brother was still hunting. And Isaac had poor eyesight. He had good hearing but poor eyesight and was tricked into giving the blessing to Jacob. The blessing was a promise of abundant food from the land. The blessing was dominance over other people. The blessing was about whoever cursed him would be cursed themselves, and whoever blessed him would be blessed themselves. Isn't that a wonderful blessing that each and every one of us want? Genesis chapter 27 and verses 41 is the saddest moment in the narrative. It is where we could hear Esau now getting upset because he realized that he was now hoodwinked. He was bamboozled. And we could hear Esau in the room with his dad saying, Father, is there not another blessing? Isn't there another blessing that you can give to me? 
And my friends, here is where it is that Esau finds out that his brother had deceived him. And this relationship is now broken. And he vows in that same time, in the passage I read to you in verse 41, that he's going to wait until his father dies and he's going to kill his brother. Relationships. Relationships can be hard. But here we have, here we have that the ones who are closest to us can sometimes hurt us the most. Many of us will emphasize, empathize with Esau because the people who are supposed to support him, they steal from him. The people who are supposed to have his back deceived him. He's out in the field working hard, but he doesn't realize that he is being, that a scheme, a plot is being, being made against him. And that day, Esau became aware of who his so-called brother really is. It is a shame when relationships crumble. It is heartbreaking when relationships crumble. And here is the challenge. Here is the challenge when relationships uh, poses some challenges with us. Here is the challenge when relationships are actually broken. Number one, it is, it is, it is that we have to fight against becoming like them. All right, you're not with me yet. When relationships crumble... We have to fight so we don't become like them. Esau began to, began to plot revenge. The, he plotted that he was going to kill his brother. He was going to destroy his brother. Why? Because he began to get bitter when he realized that something was stolen from him. He became dirty like them. Messy like them. Shallow like them. And like the New Yorkers say, shady like them. It is sad when there is a challenge for us not to become like them. And the second is for us not to harbor bitterness and angry feelings towards them. After all, uh, they didn't say, I'm sorry, after they took his birthright. They, they, didn't, they didn't try to, to make amends. They just tried to hide their wrongs. So in all due respect, when we think about Esau, we should say, look, the problem is not with him, so why in the world should, she, should he make amends for it? They didn't respond to my emails. They didn't answer the phone. They, 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 they blocked me on social media when they were the ones who were wrong. They're the ones who did me bad, and yet, yet no one wants to acknowledge the fact that Jacob had stolen from Esau. We all talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But everyone discounts Esau, and he's painted in a negative light. He is the one that was done wrong, and yet everyone praises Jacob. Jacob came out of the womb holding the man's foot, and no one talks about it. Everyone says, well, you know what? Esau is a bad guy. And we praise Jacob because he received something that was stolen. Or oh, you get quiet on me now. And it's a challenge when relationships break up that we don't become like them, that we don't harbor bitter feelings and become bitter ourselves like them, but also that we don't talk negatively about them. Realize that, that when someone does us wrong, the first thing we do is to make a call and tell somebody, look what somebody did to me. You see what I went through? You see what they put me through? You see what that woman, that Jezebel, you see what she did? She even took the house with the car. Oh, you guys real quiet today. And, and, and when, we, when we go through these negative experiences in, in relationships, we, we turn around and we talk bad about everyone. You know, you know Esau was there talking too. That's how Rebecca knew. Esau made it known. He wanted people to know that Jacob did this to me. His brother was the scum of the earth. And many of us have to, the challenge of talking negatively about somebody else even after they have done something wrong to us. But, but lastly, lastly, we have the challenge of not mistreating the person or wishing them bad when they've done something wrong. 
I don't know about you, but there are many individuals who, who have gone through some stuff and you've, you've encountered some challenges, even in church. Anyone know what the thing called church hurt is? When individuals say and they do some stuff that is unlike Jesus, but they still claim to praise Jesus. And many of us who come to church, we've experienced church hurt because individuals don't care for us the way that they claim they do. And they will hug us in the lobby and say all manner of stuff, but they're talking bad about you. And here's the thing, you still keep coming, and, and, and after a while, when it's revealed all the stuff that they put you through, the challenge is not to mistreat them or to say the same things about them that they said about you. Sometimes you want to wish them bad. Sometimes you want to tell them where to go. Sometimes you want to put them in their place. Sometimes you want to use those words that Peter used. The old sailor words will come out when you least expect it. Because when you've been hurt, when people have done wrong to you, the challenge is trying to keep your composure even after you know that they're right there. To hold back, Rebecca went to Jacob and said to Jacob, your brother wants to kill you, so you need to get out of town. And we find Jacob on this quest, now leaving his homeland leaving his mother and father and going to his uncle who is also a deceiver. God has a way of setting things up, right? That individuals who do something bad to you, you will look back and you will say, my Lord, look at what they're going through. And that's why you don't want to wish somebody bad because when God actually puts them to their own devices, then you get to stand back and see them and you're like, my Lord, all the bad that they've done to me, when God now pours it upon them twice times, you've got to sit back and you can only pray for them. So, so here he goes to his uncle and now he, he meets the great deceiver in the family and he has to work twice as hard to be able to get just one step ahead. 20 years passes by. And he has not been home yet. And now he decides he's going to go back home. And as he's making his way back home, God puts him through some challenges. And this is where we get our lesson today. Because as he's going through these challenges, it informs us of how we are supposed to react and respond to those who have done bad and those relationships that has gone sour. Sister Romage, can you just stay with me for a few more minutes? I'm almost done. Now he gets close to home, and the word comes back to him, your brother Esau is on the way to see you. And he's coming with 400 men. And all the wrong that he has done to his brother comes rushing back in his mind. And he's thinking now, not that 20 years has passed and things have changed. And my brother has gone through changes in his life. He's thinking he's going to kill me. How can, I, how can I fix this? Because our first inclination is to see how we can fix it by, by, by making amends, by seeing how we can repay for all the wrongs that we have done. Let me tell you, you can't repay for the wrongs that you have done. You can try, but you will see that it's a well that can never be filled. You can never repay it. It's either it's forgiven or not. Esau is coming to see you with 400 men. And guess what Jacob does? Jacob is so scared that he goes to the corner and he's like, God, I don't know how I'm going to fix this. And then suddenly someone shows up. It is Jesus in the Old Testament that, that, that comes before he's even born. And he shows up with, with, with Jacob. And he begins all his life, he's known as a fighter, as a schemer. So he goes and he starts fighting with this angel of God. And he begins to wrestle because all he's known all his life is fighting. He's had to fight since the womb. And now he's fighting again. And he begins to fight with this angel of God. But he doesn't realize that you can't fight against Jesus. He has a confrontation with Jesus in the Old Testament. 
And Jesus now, after a while, says, oh, you fighting? You think that you can fight with me? Because Jacob is wrestling. He's wrestling the fact that he has to see his brother. He has to face some of the old stuff that has happened in his life. And suddenly now, the man just twists him as it becomes daylight, twists him into a figure eight. And he says, oh, my Lord, what can I do? His hip is broken just with one touch. Because Jesus is all powerful. And with one touch now, he realizes he can't overcome this man. So the Bible says that he just holds on for dear life. And he says, I realize that you're all powerful. I realize I can't fix this mess. And he holds on and he says, I won't let go till you bless me. And Jesus turns and says to him, your name is Jacob, a supplanter, a deceiver. But from now on, your name is changed to Israel. One who contends with God. His name is changed, but he has to go through all of those challenges. He has to go through his own deceptive uh, situation with his own uncle. And when he goes through that, he's still not changed in his mind. It is not until he encounters Jesus that his life actually changes and his name is changed forever. One who contends with God that he's now prepared to meet his brother. He goes back and now Esau comes to him. But here's what Jacob does. If I could just have a few more minutes. Here's what Jacob does. He's still not fully converted. You realize that? Jacob is not fully converted. Why? Because he takes the first wife, Leah, that he really didn't love, and he places her and all of the kids in front. He stays in the middle, and he places his other wife behind. And he says, I can still fix this. So I'm going to ground up all of the cattle and all the stuff and give it to my brother as a gift so that he is going to forgive me. I told you we can't fix this. And he tries desperately bringing all those gifts to his brother. And his brother finally comes there and he sees, and his brother's first, Esau's first question to him is, what's the meaning with all these? What I want to pause to say is this. Do you realize that Esau is also blessed? Jacob stole a birthright that's supposed to hamper Esau's progress. But when he meets Esau and gives all this gift to Esau, Esau turns and says, what's the meaning of this? I don't need any of your gifts. I've got enough. God has blessed Esau even though his father was like, well, I don't know if I have another blessing for you. But God passed over all of that and still blesses his son. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't predicated on his father's blessing. It was still a blessing from God. And for some individuals who probably didn't even have a father figure in your life, you're thinking, man, I'm so doomed because I wasn't blessed by my daddy. But guess what? You have a father in heaven who blessed you. And he has to now push him and say, look, look, just take the gift. Take the gift because he's trying to buy his love. And all the while, Esau is like, I don't need it because I'm so blessed myself. And he expected the confrontation to be with Esau that when you have in a, in a bad relationship and you've had struggles, you expect contention. You expect a fight. But his brother reaches out to him, pulls him to himself and gives him a hug. God has changed Esau and was working in Jacob also and changed his life. And every time he walks, he has a limp to remind him that in the same way that God can change his own life, that God has changed his brother. My friends, sometimes when individuals do bad to us, we're going to think, that God can't change them. But in this passage, it shows that God was able to change each person in the text. 
God changed Jacob and God changed Esau. And what he wanted was reconciliation. All that we have to do is go and approach the situation. Many of us, when we encounter challenges, we don't want to talk with the person. But if you let some time pass for you to calm down, to cool down, and then go and approach the situation rationally, at least there can be a conversation. But you can't hide out in church, talk about she did that to me. I'm going to sit over here. She sits over there. He did that to me in 1988, was wearing a red suit. And continue to live a life of separation and anxiety, not failing to realize that in the same way that God has forgiven you, he can forgive somebody else. In the same way that God can change you, he can change somebody else. So here's the thing, no matter what you have encountered in your own life, no matter what challenges you have gone through, be sure that God can meet you where you are and change you forever. God can change your name. Whatever you have known by before, God can change you. God can change you. God can change you. Can I share with you my own personal story? Then we can can end here today. For years, for years, I was upset at my father. My biological father. For years, I was upset. I had a younger brother. My younger brother died very young. I was upset. I remember one Christmas, I went down to my father's house. And there were a few toys there. A few toys. You can play for me. You can play Wilkie. There are a few toys there. And I said, man, I guess all these toys are for me. I'm sharing my personal business now. All these toys are for me. And my father says, no, 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 no. These toys are for everyone else and these two are here and I said oh they're for me he says no one is for your brother and one is for you I said this man never gave me anything in my life and now he has two toys here a stack of toys over here and you're going to make me choose so I tried to grab both he said no one is for you pick one I picked up the toy I opened it, it was a car. And Roxanne, I was pissed. I can see that in church. Somebody's like trying to correct me. I was upset. No, I was pissed. It's beyond upset. Because even though I was younger, I could have punched him in the face. Oh, you, you, you looking at me like I'm, I can be saying, some of you think the same way. I was so upset. I was steaming. You know when you're so upset you can feel the heat? I brought the toy home and I was playing with it rough. Vroom. 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 And one of the wheels fell off. My mom was like, what are you doing? It's a brand new toy. I said, yeah. Sorry, mom. She's like, I don't know if it could be fixed. She says, Fleming, I didn't want it to be fixed. I broke off the door. I broke off the back. I bent the antenna. And I left it in ruins. Years later. Years later. Because it was years. Still upset. Didn't want to see the man. And God spoke to me. But before he did, he was still working on me. To this day, I tell you, I do have an issue. It's a trigger, right? We all have triggers. I go into the store, and my kids, they would be like, Dad, I like that toy. I like that toy. I'm like, get it all. Put it all in the cart. They don't know that's my weakness. They learned that today. They don't know why I do that. Because I remember it's a trigger. You have to pick. I'm like, don't pick. Just get them both. If it's my last dollar, buy it. Because you deserve it. You see how those things affect us? 
But God had to speak to me through that moment. My daughter's looking at my wife right now. She's like, oh my gosh. Years later, God spoke to me. He was like, so you're going to remain angry? You're going to speak about forgiveness and you're going to remain angry. And I called my dad up. And I didn't know what to say. He answered the phone. He was on a roof. The dad was a, a carpenter, a builder, contractor. On a roof, building a house. And he was shocked. I said, man, this man's scared. Because now I'm bigger. I'm stronger. I could punch you in the face. And you're going to feel it. But God had to change me. Work in me. To now this arrogant, angry young man had to now become a servant. And to say, I just want to talk to you. And we talked. My friends, not too long after, my father died. But I was grateful for the ability to be able to reconnect. God changed him. And God was working to change me. I'm not finished yet. The work that God is doing in me is not done yet. And I'm sure the work that God is doing in you is also not done yet. But I'm not what I used to be. And I don't intend to go back to what I used to be. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be upset for no reason. I don't want to be the angry black man who gets upset for no reason. But God is able to transform the worst relationships if we are open to allow him to do so. So I pray, my prayer is for those today who maybe you have someone or maybe a few people that you need to talk to because you are angry at them. They hurt you. They troubled you. They did something wrong to you. And you need to address it. There are some, there are some individuals who issued some hurtful experiences to you and maybe they're not alive anymore, but you need to take it up with God. And I challenge you today to, be, to go to God and say, God, you got to take this thing out of me. You got to help me through this moment. Because I can't address it with them, but I know that I can still address it with you. Can you bring healing to me for the hurt that others have done to me? Can you please save me, God? Because I don't know how to fix this. And that's what wrestling looks like. If you go to God in prayer and you say, God, please help me to take care of this situation. Help me, oh God, through this, this thing. Help me to process it. Help me to be able to finally share it. Because many of us are dealing with some stuff we don't mention to anybody else. But I pray today that you will face those challenges. That you'll be able to present it and find healing through it. Find healing. That's my prayer. There are those today, outside of all of what we have said, in terms of forgiveness, in terms of being able to address the concerns and issues in your life, that maybe one step is to actually present yourself to God. And it may be that you are doing Bible study. It may be that you're getting prepared to turn your life over and show that by baptism. Whatever decision that God is leading you to, whatever it is, this is the call for you. That you need to make a change in your life. Just like Jacob encountered God and made a change and his name was completely changed, God can do that for you. That no matter what you encountered in your life, you can change when you have Jesus by your side. But you need that encounter. And today, if you're under the sound of my voice and God is speaking to you, the Holy Spirit has touched your heart and you're saying, look, I want to surrender my life. I need to make a change in my life. And that is you today. There are individuals here who have cards. There are individuals here with cards. I'm going to ask you to do this. Just raise your hand. They're going to pass a card to you and you're going to be able to make a new start in your life. A change in your life. 
Whatever you were known by before, that name is now changed. If that is you today, I'm going to ask you to do something very brave. Just, just, just stick one little finger up. I see your hand. I see a couple of hands over here. There are some individuals with cards. Just please hand them that card. Hand them that card. We want to pray for you. I want to know your name. I want to be able to pray over you. I want to know that, this, look, God is working in your life, and this is the moment that he has called you for. You're simply saying, look, I'm going to make a change in my life. I've been through some hurtful experiences. I've even been hurt by the church, by individuals in the church who claim to trust God and serve God, but it's hurt me. And I want to make myself available to Jesus. That's all you're saying. They're going to hand you a card. They're going to hand you a card. You're just placing your hand up, just saying, look, I need a card. I need a card today. I want to make a change. Today is a moment of change in my life. I'm going to pause for a moment, and we're going to have a word of prayer and end the service. But you're just simply just saying, look, I just need a card. I want somebody to pray for me. I want somebody to pray with me. I need a change in my life. I need a change in my life. There's still time. They're right over there walking. If you need a card, we don't want to miss you. We want to pray about it. We want to pray about it. Church, in the stillness of this hour, I'm going to ask if we can just bow our heads. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray together. Father, today, we understand that there are challenges with so many different relationships. And it's a challenge, oh God, not to wish bad on the other person. Not to wish that they would be struck dead. Not to try and avoid them. But Lord, we know that you are with us. When we come to you in prayer, oh God, you hear our cry. You hear our petition. So today, oh God, we ask that you will continue to lead us and direct our path. Father, you saw the hands that were raised today. And we ask, oh God, that as they have all received a card, and those even now online who have yet to receive a card or make a decision for you, Lord, I pray that they will make a decision before it's too late. Father, for those that have been, been through turmoil, through trauma, through different circumstances that have been very hurtful in, in their lives, Lord, I pray that you will draw near like you have done for me. Lord, do for them. Lord, bring healing like, like never before. Where, where there was chaos, Lord, bring peace. And we pray that as we continue as a church, that we'll be mindful of what we say, what we do, and the care that we show, the love that we give. And when it's all said and done, you will look at your church, you would look at each one of us and our families and say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, we look forward to that day. So keep us faithful. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.